Well, howdy, good to see you. And I know it's important to get you right now before everybody gets ready for Thanksgiving because you are a big Thanksgiving person. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Very important. I've got a three-day ritual of trying to smoke my turkey, too, so I've got a lot of work to do. So, yes, this is the right time to do this. Okay, the important question is what do you smoke your turkey in? Well, uh, it's less important to me about the wood. I know a lot of people get very particular, and it's more important about the procedure. You just have to do it right because you got to get that thing cooked correctly all the way through. So get that a good injection, get some good apple cider inside of it, and then <laughs> you're pretty much good to go. So We might have to do a Thanksgiving podcast. This is not <laughs> it, but now I am really intrigued. You hear most of the people frying the turkey. That's the thing to do, and it's delicious. Dangerous, but delicious. You don't hear a lot of smoke. That's very, very, I, I'm very intrigued with that. Good on you. Um, that might be for another conversation. Obviously, we're here to talk baseball, mostly Mariners, but there's some other things to talk about as well. Uh, in the next hour, we're going to get to, um, it, it, free agency has kicked off. I know it, it wasn't exactly with a boom. I know that there are a lot of question marks, not just for the Mariners, but all of baseball. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to the who's, the what's, the how's, uh, the why's, and perhaps what to expect, uh, that coming up in a little bit. But I also uh, have a couple of things that uh, I want to touch on, uh, the bigger picture uh, that has happened in baseball in the last few days that have just uh, been big pieces, big game-changing pieces, the things that have had me really kind of looking at baseball a little bit differently, and that's a good thing. We'll get to that in just a couple of seconds. But also on the Mariners' front, some news and notes before we get to the others. And I think the biggest thing that we have seen in the last week is the high performance and instructional camp has wrapped up. It, it, it is over. It is done. The Mariners were able to get 40 of their prospects, some good week, work for the better part of five weeks. Uh, we did hear late last week that they had uh, two tests, two COVID tests come back. Uh, not positive. It turned out that only one was. It sounded like uh, one was a false positive, but they did cancel the final two games of their instructional league season. Um, so it's good to hear that everybody, for the most part, there's just one that was out there was not a player from my understanding, but uh, all players are now home. They've wrapped up their work. They were able to get in work that they were not able to get in during the season in actual competitive games against other teams. And I got to tell you, Howdy, I um, talked to Sam Carlson. I'll have a piece this weekend up about him. And I, I've got an interesting theory about what he might be. And if, if I'm right, it's going to be very, very exciting. And I'll just say that okay. somebody else has set the example for him in the not too uh, recent, not too distant past. But I talked to him quite a bit, and he said, you know, you think about everything that they go through to play baseball, and they can't go do anything after, and they're in their hotel rooms and everything else. He said, you know what, we couldn't be in a better situation. Right now with everything that people can't do, what better than to be able to go to the facility every day and play baseball or work out in baseball and be around our, our, our baseball teammates. And, uh, you know, that was a great perspective in what they were able to do down there despite having to go through everything that they did. But it was from all uh, that we've heard a successful camp. Noel Lee Marte, I'm told, made some very, very good strides. Uh, you know, Julio Rodriguez, obviously all eyes were on him and continue to be as he is playing in the Dominican right now on a team with Wander Franco. I mean, if you're looking for some baseball to watch in the offseason, there's a gift. I mean, two of the top prospects in baseball in the same Dominican League team. How fun is that? Uh, Johan Ramirez is also playing in winter ball. I think he'll be an interesting to w one to watch as well. Luis Liberato on the same team with Julio, Eric Falea also uh, playing. So the Mariners do have a couple of players that are down there getting real competitive games. And, and quite honestly, I think they're going to be a step ahead of the others. Pitchers that got work, Carlson, which was huge because he's coming off of not pitching in almost, what, three years because of the Tommy John surgery and then the shutdown. Uh, Emerson Hancock was there, but only performing, uh, only participating in the high performance camp as they are being very careful with him because there have been so many stops and starts since the draft. They're actually, I was told, kind of treating him uh, like they treated Logan Gilbert coming off of mono. And mm. he, of course, you know, that hit him right after the draft. And what do you do with that player? You know, it's already been an odd season for them and you, you want to do everything right. Um, so Emerson Hancock has been getting him work, but you never saw him in games or anything like that. Taylor Trammell looks like he made some strides. If anybody was following him, you saw that he was leading off for the instructional league team in every game, had a ton of strikeouts in mm. about the first half of games. And I, I saw people just, you know, just freaking out on Twitter about it. 
And right about the time they started freaking out was about the time where he stopped striking out. And then he finished very strong in that regard. Exit velocities, if you were following along, they had those on the scorecards were fantastic. So a lot of good. You want to know who the standout superstar was of this, though? Yes, from absolutely. I've been waiting for this whole time for you to get to that. What's the thing I'm really excited to take away from this? Uh, it's a name that I haven't mentioned. It's a name that perhaps doesn't get mentioned enough. And it's a name to keep an eye on starting in spring training next year. Any guesses? Could be ready next year. It's not Jared Kelnick. It's not Julio Rodriguez. It's not Taylor Trammell. It's a hitter. It's a hitter. It's uh, a corner infielder. It is not a corner oh, infielder. Oh, then I have no idea. I'm totally lost. Cal Raleigh. Ah, I was going to say it, but everyone talks about him. You misled me. <laughs> Everyone's oh, always talking about Cal Raleigh. No, 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 no. Not like they do like not like they do like Jared Kelnick and Julio Rodriguez. And not All like right. they did. You didn't hear very much about him during, you know, the alternate site. Um they had him hitting only and he tore the cover off of the ball, which he did the entire time down in Tacoma. Let's remember he's a switch hitter, and uh, it, from what it sounds like, he was locked in on both sides of the plate. They like him as a catcher, and what a great thing for a catcher to be able to send him to a camp and say, you know what? Don't worry about the catching. We want you just to think about your hitting now. That never happens. But I love the way that he has been handled. And uh, apparently there's a lot of excitement for what they've seen. It's been so hard for the minor leaguers and the prospects to take steps forward without games. There's a good possibility he's taken a step forward. So uh, a lot of excitement about that. So all of that is done now. And uh, that's all they're going to do this offseason with the, the numbers of the COVID numbers coming up right now. It's now all the rest of the camps are shut down. I'm sure they'll do some things virtually, but um, they're kind of putting everything on lockdown right now for safety's sake. And, uh, you know, you hope that there's a, something for them in, in spring training next year. You hope that there is something for them in a season next year. But we're going to have to wait and see you know, what, what unfolds over the next couple of months. It's interesting, really exciting. I mean, there's what a what a weird season for the Mariners prospects for prospects in baseball. You had the taxi squad. I was curious to see how different this was going to be, or maybe uh, what kind of a step this whole instructional season would be compared to how they handled the taxi squad situation. Well, the big difference was they were actual games. And I think that we were so excited about the taxi squad and, oh, all the young prospects are going to be playing against each other in games down in Tacoma. And they weren't really real games. They didn't have enough players to do that. And they only played like three or four times a week. And then things got shut down because of the wildfires and, and things like that. And uh, I think it was tough. From the guys that I've talked to down there, it, I think with all the optimism and isn't this going to be cool, the thoughts that we had of it going into the spring, it was tough. It was it was a grind for them to see the same people every day, uh, to not have real games, to kind of wonder what it was they were playing for at that time. And uh, I think that when you got to Instructional League and you were able to actually see the different uniforms even and, and faces that you might kind of recognize from your time in the minor leagues and, and the bigger prospects of the teams that were in Arizona. Um, I, I think they got a lot more out of that. And, you know, James, it kind of blows me away. They didn't do that in Florida. Hmm. It was just the Arizona teams that did hmm. this. So, you know, it, yeah, it, I think this is obviously going to benefit any games are good games, but they got five weeks. I think they played four, um, four a week in there and you saw pretty much a consistent lineup. So mm -hmm. I think it, you know, wasn't too much experimentation. You know, they had pitch counts and things like that, but uh, I think that they got, you know, the key players uh, got a representative five week kind of uh, snapshot and, and work in and, and games and able to uh, approach games as such. And, you know, they're the only ones who did. Interesting. So now we enter into a relative action dead period in terms of baseball being played outside of Julio Rodriguez for a Mariners fan. Let's talk through some of the developments that have been going on on a larger scale, some of the Major League Baseball headlines that have come out just in the last couple of weeks. And let's start with um, with Kim Ng. Um, I would love to just get more of your perspective and thoughts on her hire, uh, what this means for baseball, more of some of the background that you know of her and uh, her last run to attempt to try and become the Mariners GM at one point. I just would love to hear more of your thoughts. Yeah, that was uh, pretty amazing to look down because we didn't even really hear 
that she was up for that. Usually you hear, you know, the GM carousels and things like that. So it was just an absolute shock to look down and see the alert from MLB that she was about to be hired as GM. And uh, she interviewed for her first GM job, I think it was 15 years ago. I mean, that is a long, long process. I spoke to her uh, when we were in L.A. Um, pretty long, long time ago. I think it was about, it was after her first or second interview. And was just really impressed, um, which obviously everybody is. But what I found interesting at the time is uh, I think that um, she was of the mindset that, you know, she was ready for this and she might not have everything that everyone else would have. And on her end, that was the scouting, which back then was pretty much exclusively eyes. And she said, but that's not a big deal. I know how to hire the right people. I know how to take information. You know, I will have a scouting director and I will learn and continue to learn as that goes on. And to hear her talk and to hear and to kind of read and follow a little bit more, um, she did. She did develop a little bit more of an eye. But as we know, in the last 10 years, kind of more really rapidly accelerating in the last five, the numbers have become such a huge part of it that it is, you know, longer it makes it more accessible to everybody. And something that we have seen in baseball, not just at the GM ranks, but at the manager ranks, at the coaching ranks, is uh, you don't necessarily have to have played the game. It's certainly not at the big league level. You think back 10 years ago, every coach, every manager, not so much the GMs, but a lot of them did, had played at the big league level. And, well, you didn't play. I don't see that as an excuse or as a bad thing anymore. I think you can learn as much about the game or almost as much about the game uh, from the numbers. And uh, she was an athlete as well and pointed out that, you know, she understands those things about competition, about what it is, you know, the pressures that are on an athlete because she played competitively as well. I don't think it ne you know, necessarily has to be uh, you played at the big league level. I think that we are learning more and more that, um, there's a lot that can be learned about this game and progressed in this game without that. And I think that the other thing that we're seeing of late, it's easy to say that, but we're also seeing of late the players that are coming up, the younger players, they believe that too. I don't think they put as much into, well, that guy played, so I'm going to listen to him. There are things they will get from that guy, but they are so starved for any information that will get them over the top. And now I think that you think you look into the technologies and you look into the different different systems and the different ways uh, to train. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that was learned on a baseball field by somebody 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that is, uh, that's really, I think Kim Ng finally getting hired, that kind of opened my eyes to, you know what, for everything that I, I for a long time was, I hate change. I want no change in baseball. You know, it's, there's a romantic side of baseball that you love all the tradition and all the, you know, rookies should be seen seen and not heard and, and, and all of those things um, and eyes and eyes are important but I've always thought it was a balance but um, you know this is a positive when you look at all what the numbers have done what it has done is it's given more access to the game it, it's improved players but it's also given more access to the game and without that I'm not sure that we would see this or it would take a lot longer this has taken too long in my opinion she has been wildly qualified for a long time and it was a smart hire on the Marlins part because you think of how they do things. Let's see. You know, when she went to the league offices, I, I felt horrible about that. To me, it was like she's giving up. You know, she's going to go take the job in New York on Park Avenue. She's gone out there. She's interviewed. She's found out that there's really no not much point in it. And now she's, you know, going upstairs. The knowledge that she has gained working there, uh, she knows how every club operates. She probably knows a lot about their budgets. She also was heading up international. The Marlins invest as much as you can in international. That's an important aspect for them. And it's no longer dollars there. It's you know, with the caps that they have and the rules that they have. Uh, you can do smarts and, and scouting and knowing what's going on down there. She is bringing so much to that position that uh, it was an incredibly smart hire for anybody. I think even more so for a team like the Marlins. So, you know, good on Derek Jeter for getting that one. In my opinion, right, we'll find out. You know, she'll be judged on the moves that she makes. But 
Uh, I think that uh, obviously a huge day for the game, huge day for women in baseball. And to me, it, it's not really going to, we're not going to know how big it was or how significant it is because the real test will be, she's opened the door, who comes through? You've got to have more come through. And Susan Waldman told me that, you know, years ago. Uh, she, of course, is a Yankees broadcaster, the only woman doing full-time play-by-play uh, of any team. And she's done it for a long, long time. She's the pioneer. So that's great. But, you know, she's heartbroken that nobody else has walked, walked through that door. And I kind of see the same thing with the GM. And we are seeing more women in baseball. We are seeing them make a very concentrated effort to get more. There are scholarships, there are programs aimed at getting women into the game in all different levels. There are a couple of coaches right now on the high performance side. There's a, there are a good number of women doing things like that. You're starting to see it in baseball ops with the analysts. So it would appear that it is moving in the right direction. And all of that, you know, to me says, hey, for everything in baseball, you know, gets wrong. And we talk about how much the game needs to be fixed to look at how it's moving in that direction and to look at what Theo Epstein did the other day, that to me, those are two good things. When Theo Epstein stepped down from the Cubs, and one of the things he said is he wants to spend the year finding how he can help with some of the problems that baseball is facing right now, I'm like, okay, are, are we starting to see you know progress made on some very important fronts? I hope so. Hmm. I'd love to get into the Theo story next, but uh, from your perspective, I'd just love to know how you reacted to the news, how it felt for you as you saw Kimming be hired as the general manager of the Marlins. What was that day like? What was that moment like? Have you spent some time reflecting on that personally? It took a long time, and I think I'm still kind of going through that. I, as an individual, have always, and it's naively, um, I, I've tried to separate. I, I don't I'm not always comfortable being seen as a woman in baseball. Uh, to me, it's, if you do your job, if you do your job well, it should be good enough. And it's not. <laughs> it's just, you look at hiring, and it's not just women, it's minorities as well. You know, there are obstacles to it. So uh, for me, uh, my first was, wow, it's about time. But it wasn't because she was a woman. It was because she's darn good. You know, this is she has more than paid her due. She has more than earned her stripes. She is ridiculously smart. It's a great hire. That was my initial feeling. And it wasn't, you know, a, about the gender issue there. And as I continued to think about it, and because you try and push the negative out. And, you know, just my insight in this is, it's so funny because, oh, isn't it hard to do your job? I've heard that from day one. The problem is never or rarely, you know, I can count on one hand, been in the clubhouse. It's been everything outside of the clubhouse. It's been other media members. It has been, and, and not now. I'll go ahead and say that. It, I'm, these are things in the past. The media group is fantastic and uh, not much wrong now, period. But I've done this for over 20 years now. So you can imagine I ran into some things. Um, and a lot of it has just been the perception. It's been, you know, you always feel that you have to do the job better. You're under a different microphone or microphone <laughs> microscope than anyone else. Um, if I slip up or if a woman slips up, it's going to be blown up and you know, just beyond. And quite often when a, a male counterpart does, you don't hear anything about it or it's brushed off. For me, the biggest thing has been realizing that there it's just it's just where we are. There is a percentage of the sports listening, viewing, reading audience that is not going to take their sports from a woman. And I think we all spend time trying to win that person over. And well, I'll outsmart them. I'll do this. I'll do that. It, it's it, it, it hit me one day that you know what? These people are there. There's nothing you can do to change that. So as far as I'm concerned, they don't exist. It's you've got to let that go. So that, you know, you try and push as much. You don't want to ever come into a situation where you think you're at a, at a disadvantage. And, and so that kind of is why it took a long time for it to sink in to me that this is a big deal for women. And as much as I try and put blinders on that, that doesn't mean I do try and help other women in the business, anybody who asks for help. If I see something, I do what I can, um, and happily so. But I, I don't like to draw the line. You know, I, I like to be looked at as an equal. Um, I don't like to have to fight to be an equal. And if I do, I try not to think about it. But so when this happened, 
I tried not to look at it as much as a gender issue as it was, this is the best person and awesome person for this job and good for the Marlins. Mm, great. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. That means a lot to hear your perspective on that. And yeah, thanks for all you do for the Mariners community, for the baseball community, for the media community. Um, it's a pleasure to do this stuff with you. But yeah, that's a great perspective. Thank you for that. Uh, let's move forward to Theo Epstein and uh, the decision you mentioned earlier that uh, he had stepped down uh, from his role and is deciding to take a year off to evaluate and make contributions. He said he doesn't anticipate working in baseball or for baseball or for a team in this next calendar year. Um, I'd love to know your thoughts and perspective on some of the comments he made and potentially uh, what impact he could have and this move could have on baseball. You know, it was, um, it, Let's, let's first start with the whys in this happen. And it's very interesting, and I love the perspective, and this is so Theo. If you know Theo at all, he's um, – baseball is is a lot – is obviously, you know, his life, but he also has other things, other interests, very smart, very well-rounded person on top of everything else. And he had always said that this could be a 10-year job for me. This uh, wasn't something that he saw himself doing forever, but – doing with one club forever. And the thinking behind that was after 10 years, you need new eyes on a situation. And so, you know, it wasn't about him. You know, I'm not going to wait around until I get fired. It was, I'm doing this well, but it, it's time for another challenge for me. And it's time for new eyes for the Cubs. And he left a year early and why he left a year early. Obviously things have, have changed drastically. The landscape is, is very different, but I, I think uh, a bigger part of it is, is there had been rumblings about this uh, for a couple of months, but now it appears that it's happening. It looks like the Cubs are heading towards a rebuild of some sorts, how big a scale it is. I'm not sure. I think it's a bigger scale than what people would have thought. I don't think it's going to be a reload or a bandage situation where they try and add on. Uh, I think that they are coming up on doing something very different. And that's one of the reasons why I think Theo left when he left was it needs to be one person who is setting that. You know, and I agree with that, by the way. I think that that move of saying they're going to go through a rebuild, it's going to take a few years to do it. If I start this thing, there's no way that I can be sure that they're going to carry out the exact same plan or that they even should. Somebody else is going to come in with a very specific vision, and no one's going to be able to pick up exactly what I want. So I think in that sense, there is a nobility to it. Mm -hmm. I don't see it as him ducking the situation and saying, I don't want to be uh, no. there while it's go looking bad at the end. I don't see it that way. I suppose you can interpret it. But I do think that that's a smart move for him. I'm actually a little bit surprised that the organization didn't try to go one of two ways and say, hey, will you stick on for this for five more years? Like, this is what we want to do. Let's make this official now or let's you know let us make the decision to move on from this and make it about them so i'm a little curious that they sort of left it in theo's ballpark to be able to make his own decision about it but i think ultimately it's the right move for everybody well i think that he was up front with i mean this 10-year thing isn't something that he just sprung up on him in the last month it's been the you know it, it's been the plan for a long time so they're all on the same page which i think is important and perhaps they think that you know maybe they do need some new eyes or it wouldn't hurt them to have new eyes of course it's probably gonna be jed hoyer so it's, you it's know, not who, that new of eyes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know it, or they're coming maybe that's why it was easier to let theo go mm. at, at that point um but I, I, you know, like the idea that, you know, he is younger. He does have a younger family, relatively younger family, that he's going to take that year. I wouldn't be surprised if it's more than a year. I, he's talked about working in nonprofits. And, you know, he's a guy that uh, I don't think, you know, he's not going to leave anything undone. So it'll be yeah. interesting to see what happens there. He'll be a huge name when he's available. Uh, most clubs would want him. There's no question about it. You know, he didn't need to prove to the Cubs or anybody else that he could rebuild that organization. He's rebuilt them once and other, you know, and the Red Sox as well. It, he's he's going to be fine. The thing that really jumped out at me was just the line that he wanted to make himself available to baseball to help in other areas. And uh, he also, he talked with in another interview about, you know, he realizes that he was kind of a, a part of perhaps the start of all the things I just said that were wonderful and making baseball more accessible in the numbers. It's also taken a little bit of baseball away and uh, kind of made it less interesting for some. And he said that, you know, he feels somewhat responsible for that. He kind of was that initial number guy 
and would like to work to see what he can do to, to help baseball in the bigger picture. And when I put out that that was his quote, and that is what intrigued me is how could he help baseball? Yeah, you know, he has said he wants to run another organization, which to me is a little bit of a surprise. I'm like, he could set his sights higher. I don't think he has anything left to prove hmm. as a general manager, unless it's in his head. He wants to come to the Seattle Mariners and do it. <laughs> Um, well, you know, that's an interesting aspect of it. There are two things about this that still are interesting to me. What you're talking about now, I would like to get to more. But one of the early fly just random rumors was that there are two teams that reached out to Theo, knowing everything that was going on with him and his decision, and still inquired about whether they would come to him. And the Mariners are rumored to be one of those teams. And I thought that was an interesting thing. A lot of times as Mariners fans, people get a little cynical that they're not trying to spend the extra dollar to go the extra mile. Uh, They're not pressing on the new avenues. They're willing to stay in the middle ground of decisions and not take big risks. That's a that's a Pete Carroll type of move to step out and say, look, this is an enormous flyer. There's almost no chance this works, but we need to make sure that we try this because we think that there's an incredible opportunity for us and it's worth a worth a risk, worth a chance. So I thought that was an interesting thing. Yeah, I, I have nothing on that. I don't know how that would work because, you know, you're in the Cubs situation. We're already down that road with the rebuild in place. Uh, I'm not saying that Theo wouldn't help. Of course, you know, he's one of the best baseball minds out there. He's one of the best sports management minds that's ever been involved in sports period. So that's, I mean, that's unique. That's powerful. Yeah, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to disagree with any of that. My curiosity is just how would that work where you're at right now? But the thing that really kind of when I put that quote out that he wanted to help baseball and, and a couple of people tweeted me back was commissioner. <laughs> I, you know, I like, yes, tomorrow, please. Uh, I don't think it would ever happen that fast, but why wouldn't he have his eye on commissioner? And wouldn't he be, you know, an incredible choice with you know, rather than he's also said he's you know interested in, in ownership. And again, to me, I'm like, well, that sounds boring compared to what you did. But then I look down in Miami and say the same thing. Oh, Jeter, he's just looking for something to put next to his name. You know, no, he's doing things down there. He's, he's, there are different things that you can do as an owner. Uh, you can also be a part of the ownership groups and the meetings and that as we've learned, and as we didn't have a good taste of that before, you should have during the shutdown when they were trying to negotiate things, that is what is largely responsible for the direction of baseball. And so, you know, perhaps that is, uh, you know, a good place for him as well in ownership. But in that, to me, if he wants to get into that and if Jeter is doing what he's doing right now, perhaps there is some cause for optimism. To me, the most pressing thing in baseball, yeah, you got to get the viewership up and yeah, you got to make it more interesting, but you got to get some sort of labor piece or labor understanding. And that is the biggest thing. And if there was anything that he could do on that front, you know, that that's critical right now. I don't know that that's the direction he's going in. I don't think that that's the direction that he's going in. Uh, But they need a Superman. They need a hero. They need somebody to to come and help out with that because you're going to be facing not only the collective bargaining agreement coming up at the end of the year, but we're going to go through everything we went through in the shutdown trying to set a season for 2021. (laughs) We're going to do that again. That was not fun. And Little to no, I'd say no progress was made on that. Perhaps some progress in that they got through a season and both sides had to do a lot of things right to get through a season. And did and you know, now I think when you're watching the disaster that is college football and the challenges that the NFL is facing right now, I think there should be a greater appreciation for what baseball did in that regard. But, you know, that is, to me, uh, to have a you know somebody like a Theo Epstein who perhaps to turn some attention to that, again, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I think that that would be huge. But regardless, whatever he chooses to do in the game for the greater good of the game, uh, I'm all for it. Put him on board. Uh, that's that's a plus. Yeah, I'm interested in Theo Epstein's hermitage to try and uh, lock himself away in a cave and just think, let his mind go and figure out what the next edge is in baseball. The statistical revolution has been 15 years long. This is not like a very recent thing. The popularity, we may be at the peak of the bell curve, but this has been going on for quite some time. And there's always been a thinking in the game that it's a pendulum. It'll swing another direction. And right now we swung so far in this statistical revolution um, sort of way that it's really difficult to see what the pendulum swing on the other side would even look like. 
how can you even get to that spot? Specifically, since every other sport is moving the same way as far as statistical revolutions go, and they're all in the same spot. <laughs> they're all moving towards everyone's using the numbers, everyone's using deeper dives into what the numbers mean in order to make really small and big decisions. So there isn't some sport or some league that's moving another direction yet. So if, if Theo Epstein does believe that there is the other side of this pendulum, a way to break the mold right now, but he doesn't know what it is and he needs to go find it. I'm curious. I'm glad that somebody's trying it and somebody's thinking to try and get the game changed because I agree with him. There needs more action. We need the ball and play more often. We need uh -huh. to see more athleticism actually working. And I'm tired of just watching guys go up with one thing in mind. I, just, I don't think it's very interesting. So um, I'm here for it. I'm excited for what Theo Epstein could do, and I hope it's successful. Yeah, I do too. It'll be interesting to watch over the next year. I hope he's just not, you know, walking the dog and taking the kids to the park. <laughs> I hope that there is, and I'm sure there is. I don't think he's someone who could sit still for too long. Yeah. So let's move forward a little bit to the off season coming up for the Mariners. Um, we've gotten through some really good stuff with where things are at with baseball. I don't want to touch too much on what potentially the salaries and um, in terms of just like how baseball spending is going to go or what COVID's going to do to revenues coming up. Those are bigger questions for another day. But what I am interested in is some of your insight and perspective into what the Mariners may be planning to do heading into this upcoming free agent class. Well, I, I think it's really, you know, where are we right now with the free agency? Very little has gotten done. We're trying to kind of glean information on which way the market is going to go. I think you look at it and, oh, it shouldn't go that well, considering what we have seen leading up to this and considering, you know, where we know that teams are sitting as far as revenues and, and how they judge what their revenues are and how they judge what the impact of the revenues were. Um, I think it was, uh, was it a shock to you that Brad Hand cleared completely through waivers at 10 million? In some way, but then I think about the reliever market and how are teams gonna view relievers without knowing exactly how the season's gonna operate? Like relievers are already a risk to sign and bring in. Then you add in the fact how many games we're going to play, where we're going to play them. Um, <laughs> the collective bargaining agreement is coming up. I know I said we're not going to talk about these things, but these are the factors the teams are considering. So if anyone is going to be impacted by the market, I would say that relievers are going to be the ones that experience the most because I think teams will be reticent to do multi-year deals. Um, and I don't think everyone knows whether or not they're going to be a contender next year, depending on what the season's going to look like. So I think reliever market may be a little slower. Okay. We see that, and then we see the Drew Smiley move, which seems like that is a lot of money to pay for a guy not to pitch this year. Yeah, uh, real curious move. That's a two-year deal, right? Yeah. Uh, basically, they signed him saying, we know you're going to miss this in this this entire next year, recovering from surgery. We're in on that. We know that's going to happen. But we're going to be in a position. We know we're going to be competing and in over the next three years. So after this next season – if he's right and ready to go at a bargain salary at that point, when the collective bargaining agreement will all be finished out and we won't have to worry about filling out that middle of the rotation piece, it's a, it's an interesting move, um, but I, I think in some ways it makes sense. They don't have a lot of money they have to spend right now, as far as I can see, and they have the flexibility to make the move, and it's, it's a long-term and short-term play at the same time. But it is curious. It's different. Robbie Ray. And this is somebody that I think would have been on the Mariners' radar. That is kind of one of the ones that got me. If you look at, you know, getting $8 million this year as a bounce-back player, I, I think that that kind of made things a little bit interesting on what you think the market is going yeah. to be. So there's basically been four, four people in baseball that have signed contracts, and they've all been one-year deals with the exception of uh, Smiley, which is a two-year deal. But effectively, it's a one-year deal because he's not going to pitch next year. So you're getting him for one season of play. Um, Robbie Ray is a guy who snuck up on everybody, became a great pitcher for the Diamondbacks, a wonderful starter, and then just imploded. I mean, he was a disaster this last season. Uh, he's still in his prime. I think he's 32 years old. So it's one of those obvious bounce back kind of candidates was last year just so crazy and weird and out of the ordinary for him that next year when things are more normal it's all going to be fine uh, in some ways i'm surprised that he was so off the board so early but that kind of number makes a little bit of sense to me at eight million dollars like 
if it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, it's not a debilitating move for a team. I'm just a little curious that a team like the Blue Jays is the one that made that deal. I know they saw him. They had their hands on him by the end of last season. It's just I'm not really sure if that's where I'd want to put all my chips if I'm a team that's kind of in the middle like the Blue Jays is. Well, and you wonder and you hope that that might mean that they don't feel very confident that they're going to bring Taiwan Walker back because they know, you know he is a target for the Mariners. And it'll be interesting to see how that plays out, how long he's willing to take a look. This is his first time in free agency and you know what a year (laughs) to have your first free agent season come up so it'll be interesting to see what happens there you know the mariners we know that they're looking for relief arms uh a little bit interesting in that and it may have just been you know i you can't really it's hard to hold them to hold him to a quote because sometimes things just come out but one of the things that jumped out to me is that when we talked to jerry depoto at the end of the season he talked about what the needs were. You know, relievers were looking at adding multiple relievers, and he said most likely through free agency, or you know, the majority of the players will be through free agency. Uh, when he was on 710 last week, he suggested that they were listening for trades on the reliever front a little bit more, and so that to me. It may or may not have been a tell of a direction that they were going in or thought that they would go in. Um, it may have just been, yeah, we they'd gotten calls and things were presented to him that he hadn't really thought about that are interesting. Um, regardless, he's not somebody that is going to box himself into one thing or right. the other. But uh, I did just find that a little bit interesting yeah. uh, that all of a sudden that focus had gone to trades. Um, you know, we know that they they've said multiple times that they feel that they can be competitive next year. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that looks like there's a first half and a second half, the second half, they make the moves and they go for it. Um, I don't know what they're going to spend this year. I, I, it's, you know, tough without knowing the market. It's tough without knowing how many games you're going to have next year. I would hope that they, are kind of looking at this now as like a two-year plan when they're looking at budgeting with so many things that are uncertain. Uh, I, we will see relievers. We will see a starter for the rotation. I don't think that they are going to be relying on a bounce-back ca- you know, candidate for that spot. I think they are mm-hmm. going to go out and get a solid starter. Um, I think they could bring in a bounce-back, but that won't be the primary guy. And I don't really see much beyond that. Perhaps a left-handed bat. I'm not sure where you put him unless it's like an outfield first base type. Um, yeah. I think that they are, you know, still as much as they liked what they saw this year from the players that they needed to get looks at. I think that they want to give them more of a look in the first half of next year. And I think that's probably a smart thing. So I'm curious I'm a, I want to hear some of your thoughts on what I've been thinking about the Mariners and free agency because they really have very little money on the books. It's expected. That's the plan they had. Again, they're not exactly sure from what I can read and hear when they're really going to go for it. And I think I'm more in line with you that they will think they have a better understanding of whether it's going to be next year at the midpoint or if they're going to have to wait through all of next year and really start pushing hard in 2022. But I think they would hope that by the time they reach halfway through 2021, that they're a 500-ish team, that the young guys have started to prove themselves even more. They have more answers than they have questions, and they can start building and adding instead of trying to move pieces around and, and what have you. So all that to say... I would be curious if the Mariners will really spend any significant money unless it's on multi-year guys. Um, I have a difficult time imagining them bringing in some of these relievers that may on a one-year deal for six, seven, eight million dollars because that's what they really need. They really need great relievers, right? Like it just doesn't make a lot of sense to spend that kind of money not knowing if next year is going to be your competition window. If you want to bring in five, six, seven, eight guys at two million and hope that a couple pop. And if you're good, then you can use them. If you're not, you can trade them, then great. But making those investments, I think they're going to have to find multi-year relievers that they really trust if they're going to spend good money. And that's where the trade part comes interesting to me. Um, I look at the list of available relievers this upcoming year. Trevor Rosenthal, Trevor May, Brad Hand, uh, Alex Colomay, incredible year, but you've had him before. 
Greg Holland, Kirby Gates. These are good names, but are they guys that you're for sure for three, four years you're going to want to have? And if that's not the case, then are you really willing to spend that kind of money, that above average reliever money, when you're not sure if you're going to contend next year? So trades, can you find that 27-year-old, that 26-year-old reliever that you really like? You're like, you know what? I believe this guy's going to be a top, a top of the bullpen kind of guy for the next four years. I'll invest in that guy instead of spending sort of average to above average money on rental relievers. Well, I think there are going to be at least a couple where they're not rolling the dice. I think they I think DePoto is looking for something that he can rely on and not that he has to discover or fix when it comes to the bullpen. Uh, I think that they feel, you know, because you have to get to that midpoint to take that next step. And I think they are also in that uh, kind of area where it does it can do damage to a young team if you have so many games that were there are within your grasp and they get away at the end. And for it to happen this year, that's fine. That's what this year is about. Um, for that to happen next year, I think that is something that they are going to try and protect against. And, and so I think that you do see um, one of those established, you know, back of the bullpen type guys. Uh, and, you know, you talk about three, four, five-year contracts. I'm not sure they're going to be out there. So that might not even be something that they really need to worry about too much. I don't know that the market is going to put them in a position where they have to do something too outrageous to get something like that. Yeah, so. I, I agree with you on that part. I don't think I think the teams will be reticent to hand out more years just because of the number of uncertainties. I just think from the Mariners perspective, unless you really know when your competition window starts, it's tough to so spend good money on this upcoming year's team for one year contracts and relievers. I think that's going to be a tough pill to swallow. So for me, if I was Jerry Depoto, I'd be looking for the two and three and four year guys that I can say, if this year doesn't work out, I still have myself a good player for when I'm ready, which is next year or the year after. So uh, that's that's part of my wondering. And that spills forward to the starting rotation, too. You and I talked last time about the number of arms they have in their starting rotation and how they feel about them. Uh, the upcoming free agent class outside of Trevor Bauer is full of a lot of question marks. There's not a good top end of this free agent class for starting pitching. And yet there may be a lot of options for the Mariners out there. If they're looking for two year deals or one to two year deals on guys that should be average and have a chance to be a lot better. I think there's some names out there that are interesting. What do you think? Well, I think the good news here is, is that they don't have to do too much. Yeah. I think that they very much like what they have right now. And this is one of the things that really gets to me at some point. Do they have to add an ACE, a real ACE? It's a great question now. I forever have thought, yes, I'm starting to question it. But at the same time, I mean, it's also I'm also looking through this in the vet, the lens of I need the Mariners to make the playoffs. <laughs> like right. I can't think about a World Series until I get to the playoffs. And I don't need an ace to get to the playoffs. So it's hard for me to think that they really do need it. But it's it's certainly something I'm open to question now more than I have been in the past. Yeah, and I think obviously if you look at this year, it's not you're not doing that in free agency. If you're going to do that, it would be at the deadline or it would be trade right now. And I don't know who's available. And most likely they would be one-year guys and you're not doing that. You're looking for something that's going to uh, last you a little bit longer. And I, I don't know why anybody would be signing extensions or anything like that. So that's kind of a, a tricky one right there. But, um, you know, the good news is, is they don't need a lot in that. They're very comfortable with what they have. And one of the challenges although they can maneuver it a little bit, is anybody that they bring in, they're going to put it into a six-man rotation. Mm. And, you know, as much as they like that and as much as, as valuable as that is for them, and, you know, kudos for them for coming up with that at the beginning of the year and sticking with it. And you saw pitcher injuries just skyrocket this year with all of the uncertainty and the stops and the starts, and the Mariners took care of their starters. And, and I think a lot of that, I think you can point to that six-man rotation decision as being a good part of that. Um, but when you do go with a six-man rotation, you're not quite getting your value out of all of your guys. So, I, I, you know, that's something I think that when you're looking at that pitcher as well that would come into play. Yeah, I mentioned they do like Walker. They like him on many levels. They like him not just, you know, for what they believe that he can do on the hill, but they also like what he is behind the scenes. 
And they don't need a lot. They've got Marco. Marco is that guy. Uh, but I, I don't think that you are out there looking to get the top arm. If you can get Taiwan, great. If not, uh, I think at that point, you're kind of looking at, I don't want to say a, a placeholder because you want that guy to succeed and you would want that guy there at the end as well. But basically, you're just kind of biding your time until you can get Logan Gilbert up into that rotation. I'll say, it. well. I'll say they want a placeholder. I think that the Mariners are in a really interesting position because I look at the list of starting pitchers that are available, and if they were, if this was the Mariners four years ago, I'd be really excited about this class because I think there's some great opportunities. A guy like Masahiro Tanaka, if he's truly going to make 13 mil a year like some people project, that's that's fine money for a guy who has an upside of being a two like a two type starter. Jake Odorizzi, Jose Quintana, like there are guys out there that's for average to below average money, they're going to give you at least average performance. And that's really valuable considering that like getting starting pitching innings is tough and quality starting pitching innings is even harder. So there's going to be some interesting value out there. I don't think the Mariners are in a good spot. A guy like Taiwan Walker is top of my list. And I don't love to be the guy that's like, Oh, I saw this guy play for the team. So I want him back all the time. I don't like being that guy. I think there's a lot of bias that comes with that. When you watch them play, but Taiwan Walker, you, you did get to see him. You saw his reclamation. You know his past. Then you got to see him come back and how his attitude was and how he looked and felt. And then he went on from where you were to another team and performed even better than where what he was doing with you on a competitive roster. So I think there's so many things to be excited about with Taiwan Walker, and I would feel much more comfortable. MLB Trade Rumors has him pegged at like a two-year deal at less than 10 mil a year, which I think is pretty low compared to what he just did. I would say that if you were able to get him for anything under 13 million, I'd be willing to go three years or have some options to go further than that to just to lock that deal down. You'd be 31 at the end of a three-year contract. You're not looking at like, oh, this guy could have a declining skill set by that time. I'd be willing to take more of a risk on Taiwan Walker than most teams would just because of how much you know about him. Absolutely. And and that is um... – yeah, no, that, that's something that's played into a lot of the things that they have done in the past and, and the intangibles, not just that, but what you know about, you know, how he went about improving his repertoire last year, how he worked within their system, within using the technologies that they use, the languages that they use, being open to trying different things out there, not somebody who's going to fight a scouting report, not yeah. somebody who's going to fight... Um, you know, what they're trying to do as far as, you know, the infield placement and things like that, you know, that has been a problem in the past where you get the guy to come in and he comes in, I'm not doing that, especially with a veteran. Now that, you know, perhaps has changed a little bit in recent years as more teams are doing those things, but that's something to take into account when you are looking at bringing in that guy as well, because that can have an impact. So um, I I think that uh, they have a good idea of what Taiwan Walker is right now, where he could go, why he could go, where he could go. And, you know, I think that he probably remains at the top of the list. But, yeah, you bring up all of those names, and that's something else that you really hope that they are looking at right now. You know, go out, go ahead and go get a value guy. <laughs> you know, yeah. This is the year to do that. Yes, you know, there's some great just, options. Just I'm going to list some names for you here. So Chris Archer is one that's out there who is a great bounce-back kind of candidate guy. Um, if you want – placeholder type John Lester's out there at 37 years old. He's very old, but he's been in a successful environment before. I think that's a great option. Um, You know, you could go a little bit further out and take a risk on somebody who's a little bit more established. I don't think they should do that like a Masahiro Tanaka, but there's a good chance that you're going to get regular numbers out of him. A guy that I would really watch out for is Garrett Richards. Uh, a guy that they should have a lot of familiarity with for the amount of time that he spent with the Angels. He was a great prospect. His raw stuff is still really good. He's got two really plus pitches. And you know that how he's performed in the AL West before. So, And he's still young at 32 years old. I don't think that's a huge risk if you're able to get him something similar to what I just mentioned for Taiwan Walker. I think there's some value there. Uh, Rick Porcello is another guy that's out there. His stuff's maybe not that great and some of his numbers don't look good others do there are options out there for the mariners if they do want to have and i think as where i said that i don't think they should go on rental reliever situations just because i don't know how that money spends 
I think I'm willing to spend that rental starting pitcher kind of money because if it does pop like Taiwan Walker last year, you have something for yourself this next time. Or if it doesn't work out, then you know what? You got innings out of him, <laughs> and that's valuable as a starting pitcher. So I, I think that they will end up making a, a – I wouldn't say significant, but a real investment. They're not going to bring in minor league option deals, starting pitchers to try and make the rotation. I think they'll spend some real money to get somebody. But there's one player, Shannon, that I'm really interested to hear your opinion of. There's one person that's sort of on the outside, not a starting pitcher, not a relief pitcher, not even an infielder. I am curious in the Mariners' (laughs) interest in one player. Let me guess. Does he have a World Series? Who? Jock Peterson. Yeah, I was just going to ask, does he have a World Series ring, and does he share initials with yes. a Mariners infielder, kind of, <laughs> sort of? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I'm, the reason, and I'm going to lay this case out for you. I know I emailed you this earlier, but Jock Peterson, as you mentioned, has grown up in the Dodgers organization in a really successful environment. He understands what it means to win. He understands what it means to be on a young team and to be asked to perform as a young player. He's capable to play three positions. You really only want him to play two in the outfield, in the corners. He's got a big stick on one side, uh, kind of a liability on the other. You've got a whole designated hitter, technically speaking, and the ability to move him around in the outfield, along with Dylan Moore in the infield in the outfield. I would be really curious if Jock Peterson is sitting there open on the free agent market towards the end of this this period when teams are going to be signing players for a, a one, two, even maybe a, an option third-year deal on a guy like Jock Peterson, who he's not going to be your best player. He may not even be one of your three best players on offense, but the stuff that he could bring you and the dependability of knowing exactly what he's going to do for a relatively moderate price, I think would be a really interesting option for this team. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I, I don't think he is a guy that they would chase, you know, and say, hey, this is the guy, we're going after him, and we have, you know, earmarked him, this is it, this is, their outfield is is Jock Peterson, or, or our offseason is Jock Peterson, or bust, um, simply because he's an outfielder, and obviously you look at the Mariners, and you're like, well, how do you work that with the Mariners? You've obviously got your rookie of the year is out there. Mitch Haniger, the hope is he's coming back. If he comes back, you got to play him, and he's going to be out there too. Um, but then you, you've had a lot of infielders in the outfield, uh, something that I really don't like. <laughs> and um, look, they're not going to be rushed with Jared Kelnick or Julio Rodriguez or any of their prospects, for that matter. So until those guys are ready, there are going to be spots in that outfield. And when you talk about Jock Peterson, everything that you just listed, those are all things that I know Jerry DePoto values. Uh, He is a name that I have heard before around the organization as somebody that they do like. So it's it's it would not be out of the blue if that was something to happen. Um, They need some help on the left side um, at the plate and. Where you had, you know, kind of the veteran presence of Marco Gonzalez on on the pitching side, you didn't have that so much. You had Kyle Seeger, and he was huge. He could use some help. I mean, I'm not kidding. I think there were guys that were fighting to sit in the two spots next to Kyle Seeger. Mm. And it would be great to have, you know, somebody there to help out as well. And Kyle Seeger most likely is not going to be here a year from now. now extension, possible. Do I think it's going to happen? Probably not. Um, so... I think in those terms and looking at this guy and would he fit into our system and is this a guy that we are going to value everything else? Would he be good for the young players, let alone on the field, the way that he plays the game? Yeah, he would definitely be on that list. I don't think it would be a target per se as it would be, as you were saying. If he's there, you know, is this one of those value guys that you can get and and make it work? I think that that is somebody... That wouldn't surprise me if all of a sudden you started hearing something about that in that situation. Very interesting. I know we're wrapping up on time here, but I would be curious. We've talked over the past two years about when the Mariners do decide they're going to go for it and they're really ready to contend. What are they going to spend on? What are they going to trade? Who are they going to target? 
we got a huge free agent class coming up after this season, uh, specifically with all the shortstops that are going to be available out there. And potentially with a collective bargaining agreement potentially figured out or at least on the table or perhaps done, we may have a better understanding of what the finances of baseball look like. And all that said, there could be a situation at the end of this upcoming season where the Mariners are ready to spend, they're ready to contend, and baseball's landscape is clearer for the foreseeable future. Do the Mariners want to make that step to preempt all of those things and get some value now, take a little bit of a risk by making trades or making a trade to get their one guy they target? Or are they going to put themselves in a situation and be content with competing financially with every other team in baseball who has this wide open pocketbook because of all the certainty they now have after the season ends? I don't know that they're going to have the wide open pocketbooks. I mean, they're still going to have dollars that are on on their books. So I, I don't think that the Mariners are, are losing out because they had that advantage because they had cleared so much money. I don't think the current situation is going to hurt that. I think that actually makes them stronger in where they're at right now. Um, I, I don't see them making a trade for a one-year guy in hopes that they can re-sign him to the long-term contract. That's giving up way too much because if you're going to do that, now let's remember they value what they have as well. I think it's going to be an interesting situation with the shortstop crop that is coming up and that, okay, you're learning more about J.P. Crawford. You love the glove. Uh, is that enough? Is he going to be your, your kind of glove first guy batting at the bottom of the order? Or is he going to be somebody that's going to show more offensively and, and be the guy? That you have there. I think there was some talk, some thought that perhaps with the big shortstop class coming up, you could move J.P. Crawford to second base. There were things about that about a year ago. I, I don't know that that is uh, a consideration. You know, they like Ty France. Is he the, you know. How much can you like Ty France? You know, like, can you like Ty France so much that you would choose not to get a superstar because of Ty France? I can understand some of the conversation around J.P. Crawford with that because it's just what he showed. One of the big question marks is could he be consistent on defense? You knew he had the athletic ability and the talent to play that position as good as anyone, but could he have the determination and just the consistent play to be able to justify it? Then you saw it. He put it out there, and I would count on him to be that kind of player at shortstop moving forward, but you're right. The question still does remain about his defense. I'd have an easier time swallowing the pill that, yeah, we're going to maybe pass on the shortstop class because we really believe in J.P. Crawford as opposed to, well, we're going to sit this one out because we think Ty France may be an average to a maybe above average player at third. That'd be a tough pill for me to swallow. Well, that was a fun rant, but you got a year to figure out what Ty <laughs> France is, and that's where I was going with that. <laughs> no, I mean, you'll know. You'll know. Yeah. We don't know right now. We do know that they like him very much, and I, I think that that's one of the reasons why you're not going to see huge moves in the offseason. They're going to have that first half of the season to to do that kind of, to, to just get that longer look. 60 games is great. I still have question marks about that. I think I've got some good answers on the pitching. I've got big question marks on the other side of the ball. I think they need that first half to kind of complete that look. And I think that's important. You've invested so much in these players, be it in time, be it in what you've traded them for. Let's get it right. I mean, what is another three months difference going to make? I hope they are open to if that bargain is not bargain, but, you know, value buy. If you, if you see something that you need or will need in a couple of years and it fits perfectly and you are getting it at some sort of a discounted price in this off you know COVID off season, I, I hope they have that flexibility to do that. Um, but I think the most important thing is, and I was, I've been really encouraged and they've been very steadfast in sticking with the plan, staying on the course, not taking shortcuts, not rushing things. And I know it's hard, and I know when you see the names out there, but let's, you know, basically you are a season and a 60-game season into it. That's it. And I know that, you know, 2019 in particular, in particular was incredibly painful. Let's not do that again. That was not <laughs> a fun 162 games. This year was interesting. You know, just take that last look before you make those decisions. Let them do that. Allow them to do that. And, you know, keep in your mind that, I think that when they have those answers, I don't think it's a matter of just waiting until next offseason to go for those big tickets. He'll start dealing. 
Mm. He will start making trades and they'll have the cash to bring in. You know, maybe you do make a Verlander type move midseason, not for Justin Verlander, but like, you know, the Astros did when they brought him over. They had felt they should have the, the ability to do that. So, uh, you know, I, I think that this offseason, I don't think it's going to be, I don't think this was the target to go out there and break, break the bank. I think it was next year, and appropriately so. You've got the bigger names out there next year. Great. Well, this is great stuff, Shannon. I appreciate you indulging me in some of my uh, my theories and thoughts about what the Mariners could do moving forward. I think it's going to be a fantastic and interesting season next year for the Mariners because of what we saw in 2020. It was an interesting team to watch that answered some questions and put some young players in position to shine, and they did. And the starting pitching was a wonderful surprise that I'm curious and interested to watch next year. There's a lot more hope moving forward in 2021 than I had entering 2020. And it's because of how they played in 2020. And I'm interested and curious to see how it unfolds because I think it's going to be a fun team to watch. So this is a, this is a good conversation. Well, let's hope we have a move to talk about the next time. I think we'll probably talk after Thanksgiving. So we'll get the update on the smoke, the three day smoke Turkey from you. Oof. Yes. Uh, DePoto has been known to make some early deals. Uh, perhaps we will see something there. Although I don't, you know, he's, I don't think we're going to see any kind of blockbuster this year, but maybe there will be an addition to talk about. Uh, we'll have some other things to talk about as far as who's been protected for the Rule 5 draft. Um, and, uh, man, we'll be getting closer to the winter meetings, which, of course, are not in person this year. It'll be interesting to see uh, kind of what access we have to those via Zoom, who we can talk to, and how they handle that as well. So, uh, you know, it, it's pretty crazy to think about it, that we are less than three months away from when a normal spring training would occur. Wow. It goes mm. quickly, uh, and we'll see where they are in a couple of weeks. Yeah, great. Well, thanks so much, Shannon. We'll talk again shortly.